Yeah, so welcome to the user group. Um, I'm going to take you through uh, some of our roadmap, what we're investing in now, and the products we've released and talked about with customers since the supercomputing event in November. There is more detail, and for more detail, I know many of you already have meetings arranged with us, um, but we'll be going deeper in those meetings throughout the coming week. So if you're tantalized, then uh, make sure you catch one of us for a private talk afterwards. So where have we been investing um, primarily in DDN? So the big message really is that high performance computing remains, so despite all the diversification in other verticals, high performance computing is the core um, investment for DDN going forward. So we're part way through a multi-year, around five or six year investment in our internal engineering teams into making sure we maintain our position at the leading edge of high performance computing. So we're making sure that let's say in 2018 and beyond we stay at the, this, this sort of higher echelon area of high performance computing with respect to our competitors. Uh, there's a number of ways we're doing that, and I'm going to basically talk about some of those uh, routes forward throughout this presentation. So one investment we made is within the WARP uh, initiative, so the Worldwide Academic uh, Research Partnership. This is ourselves and a group of esteemed uh, research institutions who are also performing research and making investigations into big data problems. So we're investigating in building that community uh, worldwide, and associated with that program is a $100,000 prize, which will be awarded, I think, at Supercomputing, Jeff, something like this, yeah. um, to um, collaborating researchers who are making most impactful research into this area of big data and high-performance computing. Apart from that, we have a very large investment in partnership with the DOE, uh, working with Intel on the Fast Forward program. And we've been uh, working with them on this next generation file system for Exascale. And our role in that, or part of our role in that, is to develop this new uh, layer underneath the Exascale system, uh, which is called DAOS, Distributed Application Object Store, with Intel. So what's been the, the outcome of some of these investments? Well, we've already heard the most recent announcement at SPIDER 2, the ORNL uh, um, implementation. So this is the world's fastest file system. Um, it's currently uh, just uh, been installed uh, very recently. It's over a terabyte per second in performance. Um, the important thing to note about this is we're using Lustre, and everybody knows that Lustre is an extremely scalable uh, file system platform for the very top end of the top 500 uh, challenges in terms of I.O. So in fact, you could build uh, such a system using all sorts of storage technologies out there today. The main differentiator we have with the SFA technology that we use is we do it with less. And this is, of course, a critical importance when you're building a very large system, is you know, to first order to minimize your component count. So we've built this 40 petabyte file system with just 36 of these DDN SFA 12K40 devices. So this investment we've had in HPC, obviously it's, it's having its um, results in terms of uh, wins for us and major customers in the high performance computing world, this sort of core area of ours historically, but also it's impacted these uh, related areas in other verticals. So level three is one of a very small number of uh, tier one uh, companies working in the content delivery network area. So these are the people behind uh, companies such as Netflix who deliver that content in real time uh, to your, your desktops and your, your portals. Video traffic consists of something like 40% of the uh, worldwide internet traffic, so it's a, it's a huge uh, data volume. And level three are using multiple SFA devices using GPFS to deliver that, that content to your systems at home. On the other hand, uh, a different market, PayPal. Uh, we're all pretty familiar with PayPal. Um, they use, again, multiple SFA devices to manage fraud detection in stream uh, during your um, payment processing. So if you have a, uh, a transaction with PayPal that's over a certain value, 
then within 200 milliseconds they will check you out uh, and make sure that your transaction is going to be uh, validated as it goes through the system. This has saved uh, PayPal over $700 million and represents like an eight times increase in their previous installation. So this investment in HPC, the core HPC has a trickle down effect right across these whole, all these big data markets and that's been reflected in a 19% year on year growth uh, between 2011 and 2014 across all these market sectors. So I'm of course very familiar with our life sciences customers, academic customers and commercial customers um, and also in the oil and gas sector and I've been spending an awful lot of time in, in banks as well. So working with investment banks and retail banks, uh, helping them scale both their performance and their, their archive storage. But we also have uh, other teams who work in other areas such as security and cloud and web and we've uh, gathered a very uh, esteemed number of logos in all those verticals using the same SFA and WAS technologies we've been using for the past few years. So now I want to just um, turn our attention really to products. So I'm going to go through what we've um, got today and what we've moved forward with since the supercomputing uh, last year in November. And the big message really is that the product set has, has rounded out. So coming from a tradition of really looking at core storage, parallel file systems for very high-end supercomputers, now we have a very broad portfolio covering all these big data problems from traditional parallel file systems. We have the object store system, which I'm sure some people in the audience are, are reasonably familiar with. We'll be hearing a bit more from, about that from uh, UCL, I think, after this uh, talk. And we've also more recently invested in analytics support. So taking advantage of the traditional hardware platforms, we've applied those into more business-focused analytics areas. And this is reaping some rewards in analytics. So we've launched HScaler in between the last uh, supercomputing event and this one. So at a very high level, we've got these two areas, the SFA system and the WAS system. SFA is traditional block and file, um, albeit with high concurrency, high throughput, high IOPS on the left hand side. WAS is a cloud storage system, it's an object store, it's scalable and it's globally distributed. The important message is that we are moving towards and already have some traction in making these systems defined by the applications themselves. So rather than have uh, dumb systems into which you feed information, uh, you can define the storage in some way from your application. We've made the first steps towards this in both these areas, both the traditional file and block storage and in the object stores. In the case of SFA, the application definition comes about through the use of SFX. And I'll talk about SFX in a few slides. So this is more intelligent cache management. And you should be aware that the SFA system is the only cache-centric storage architecture for high throughput available today. So for example, with SFX today, your application can make specific calls directed towards the storage device itself to manipulate that storage device better for the incoming workload. So the application in some way is defining the shape of the endpoint storage that it's talking to. With the WAS system, it's always been the same since it was launched uh, four years ago in this respect, in that when an application writes data into WAS through this API, you, the user, or your applications will also add into that information metadata, and you'll also in add into that, in into that uh, data your data protection policy that you require. And that affects the behavior of the end storage. So it's going to behave depending on what you've placed into it. If you ask for multiple uh, replicas across the globe, then that's what you'll receive. If you ask for a single replica, which is erasure coded, then that's what the storage system will react to. So a little bit more detail, the SFA system currently is broken down by this diagram here. So at the top level we have our file systems, Exascaler which is based on Lustre, Gridscaler which is based on GPFS, and Hscaler which underneath runs a Hadoop uh, system from Hortonworks and an HDFS file system. Underneath this 
we have the in-storage processing engine. So this is the embedding system that we've been shipping now for multiple years and has really in the past one to two years become extremely popular, particularly in the commercial sector where we can shrink down a true parallel file system into a single appliance and deliver that true parallel file system performance to enterprise customers without the ostensible hassle of dealing with this complex parallel file system world. And inside SFA, we have a number of features, some of which uh, come about from the origins of SFA OS about four or five years ago, and some of which are more recent. Let me just pull out uh, one or two. So real-time interrupt-free storage processing. So in fact, if you look inside the SFA device, you will see some motherboards and some processors and some memory. Um, some of our competitors will use a Linux-based RAID or a Linux-based operating system to manage the movement of blocks out to the front end. We, in fact, do use some form of Linux, but in fact, this is really doing housekeeping exercises within the SFA controllers themselves. We have over a million lines of code running side-by-side -side with this in SFA OS, and that's talking directly to our own developed drivers, both front-side and back-side. It's running in real-time in a continuous loop uh, to live you very consistent reads and write performance through the storage system and also dealing with very high concurrency by managing that workload across multiple cores and multiple um, memory systems in that, inside that NUMA system that is the controller. And Direct Protect, this allows us to um, uh, gives us a number of features around the management of SATA and SAS drives. Uh, one area of de data integrity management is uh, upon every read, uh, we need to check this data to make sure it's exactly what was written. Usually what happens is the performance will degrade at this point because you're consuming the back-end bandwidth of your system in order to, to fund this data integrity workload at the back-end. The SFA system is really over-provisioned at this back end and that allows us to perform these functions at the back end without um, affecting the front side performance. So here's some examples of that with both Lustre and GPFS. So you'll note that um, we've performed these benchmarks sort of with the parameters set that the customers normally expect. So we're using our standard RAID 6 in both cases. We've got direct protect on, so this data integrity field is, is running. We're checking all these reads. Uh, React is on, I'll talk about that shortly. And we're using a reasonable um, block sizes that you might expect a typical customer to use. And so with this, this is really one of the reasons why we're chosen for uh, the SPIDER 2 system. We deliver very high read and write performance, uh, pretty consistent, uh, very high percentages of the raw block performance through to the outside clients, measured using client-side tools such as IOR. So that 12K and the predecessor, the 10K, has served us uh, rather well at this very high end. But the very same architecture in terms of the hardware architecture and the software architecture is now embodied in this mid-range system called the SFA 7700. So the code base is identical, so the same sort of million lines of code, the same architecture, this real-time storage processing system is running inside here. We still have dual controllers uh, based on x86 architecture, interconnected uh, with a very fast interconnect and talking to the back end via very scalable SAS. But in this case, we've shrunk it down into the single box. So on the very left-hand side, the 7700, it's a 4U high system with 60 drives inside, and this will perform something around 5 to 6 gigabytes a second uh, on its own um, up to the file system. Adding additional enclosures increases that uh, and the enclosures are comprised of either 60 or 84 drives and you can have up to four additional enclosures attached to the uh, SFA 7700 controller. And this results in a peak performance in terms of the file system around 8.5 gigabytes a second. And that's reflected by these 10.2 gigasecond numbers in terms of block performance. So that's pretty much where we are in terms of SFA today. Um, it's been running as a software for four to five years, and it's now got a new hardware platform launched about this time last year in the form of 12K40. We've, we've now accompanied that with a 7700 and mid-range platform. Question? Yes, one question regarding the Oak Ridge uh, numbers. 
Uh, here in the last slide, we've seen that we have 33 about, uh, gigabytes a second from one system, and that the Oak Ridge system consists of 12 of these, but we've seen a terabyte of 36. 36, 36 by 12, it's not one terabyte. Yeah. It's about 28 gigabytes a second per machine, isn't it? Is that correct? Good maths? 36 times 28 gigabytes a second? Yeah. About a terabyte a second. <coughs> So your question is, it's too high or too low? The too low because I've seen 12, 12 of these systems? No, 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 there's 36 at Oak Ridge. Then I've missed the number. Yeah, okay. yeah, okay. definitely it's, it's 36 systems, yeah. So this is where we are today, um, but we need to do something else. Um, and this is what I'll talk about towards the end of this talk, but let's start right here. So we know that concurrency is a big problem. I'll mention this again later. That. Um, as time moves forward, you know, the, oh, I used to work in the compute area, not the I.O. area, and these application developers uh, got a bit upset a few years ago because what was happening is clock speeds were no longer going up. It was thread counts that were going up as a very well-known issue. In terms of the I.O., this is also a problem. What we're seeing is higher and higher concurrency, so larger and larger volumes of threads continually hassling our storage systems. And this is an issue for us as well. we back. So fortunately, SSDs have, have somehow come to the rescue here. So if we do large concurrent reads or writes to a RAID system based on traditional spinning disks, um, and we do that concurrently in multiple points around that RAID learn from many, many threads, we will see the performance degrades as we're trying to spin that media faster than it's capable of moving its head and moving the spinning disk around. Uh, this graph is relatively recently run in the benchmark lab in Japan, and this shows the same kind of results for SSDs. The point we're making here is for a RAID set of 10 SSDs and a standard RAID 6 stripe, we can run many, many threads across this device, um, and we get a very consistent uh, output in terms of the write performance and the read performance as we increase and increase the uh, level of concurrency on multiple points in that device, um, uh, so you can see it's extremely consistent as we move forward. So SSDs, or flash, is part of the answer here in terms of handling this very high levels of concurrency that we know we're going to be threatened with as we've seen times go forward up to exascale era. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this diagram here. This, this summarizes some of our traditional technology that's been working in SFAOS called React, and also brings into the picture some new technologies which we've announced already, um, and is coming to market uh, right now in top form of SFX. So SFX is more intelligent management of SSDs within the controller. This is part of this cache-centric architecture I was talking to you about, for which we are unique in the market of this scale of, of system. So here is React. React allows us, in real time in the controller, to take in this mixed workload from all these clients. Some of the workload is partial stripe write size, so small IOs, and some of the workload is, is nice uh, stripe write consistent IOs which can go straight onto disk. So React filters one from the other, so we take optimal usage of our controller memory, which is limited in size of course, and we also uh, um, move, uh, we move these large sequential writes straight to disk where they can be uh, written down reasonably performantly. But of course it's not really performant enough, we need to do more than this. Uh, the memory is running about a million times faster than a disk fundamentally, and so we implement SSDs of course to bridge this gap between the memory speed, memory latencies, and the disk latency. Now we can do this in crude ways, or we can do this in intelligent ways, and SFX is a more intelligent approach. So let's take um, a couple of examples here. There's in fact four areas in this picture of this new SFX system. 
SFX read, write, instant commit, and context commit. So let me just take read, just to paint the picture very clearly for you. Without SFX, what happens in our controller? Um, there's a read request from uh, some client. If that read, those blocks, aren't in the main memory of the controller itself, they get read from disk and brought forward and placed in main memory from which they are uh, taken out or sent out to the uh, client systems to fulfill that request. Uh, subsequently, what happens is that read will be cache flushed out if it's no longer read again, reread by other reads uh, in the system, and it will revert back to disk. With SFX, you can introduce a small number of SSDs, uh, for example, one or two 200 gig SSDs, and you can, within the SFA OS, associate those with a certain number of RAID LUNs and accelerate those RAID LUNs by adding a pool in between the disk and the memory. So in this case, rather than being flushed straight back to disk for a relatively recent read, we'll flush into this SSD-based cache, which is three or 400 times faster in terms of latency than the back-end disk cache. That's SFX read. SFX write is kind of similar, but we can now acknowledge your reads as they go straight into an SFX cache if they're aligned IOs, which would otherwise have gone to disk. Uh, we don't need to mirror these because these are now uh, RAID protected within the SSDs. And so then we speed up your writes significantly. A slight play on this is instant commit. And this is for applications who expect to read data that's recently been written to the system. So we can switch on this facility within SFX such that data which is recently written gets immediately fed to the read cache for subsequent reads. The application defined part of this comes from context commit. So we've developed an API which has implementations both in-band and out-of-band. So in-band means that within the SCSI protocol, you can make requests of the storage system to pin certain areas of, of data into cache. So if your application is, is trawling along and it's approaching an area where it's going to hit a certain data structure, you can preload this data structure into cache to make sure it's available much quicker than it would have been if it was sitting on uh, the, the back-end hard drives. Out of band is, is more obvious, so a manager and an administrator can talk via the management API and they can specify that a certain data structure is kept and pinned in this SSD cache. So typically for us, as people who develop not only block systems but file system solutions, we will be taking, obviously, metadata data structures for file systems such as Lustre and GPFS. We'll be specifying that they be pinned in, in some kind of cache. And similarly, if you have a pool within Lustre or GPFS which is designed for small IOs, then we'll be pinning that in cache. So what's the outcome of this in terms of economics? Um, and this really, again, reflects on the end of this talk where we're talking about exascale. This is kind of a small version of the exascale problem. So today, without SFX, if our customer requirement is for a system which does 20 gigabytes a second, uh, this will require 400 nearline SAS drives. So approximately every 40 LUNs comprised of 10 disks gives us about 500 megabytes a second each. This is around 20 gig a second for 400 standard drives. The problem being that each drive consumes about uh, 10 or 11 watts, and this becomes uh, rather expensive to power, and the cost in terms of just the data volume and the footprint um, also becomes uh, rather large. And of course it's unnecessary if we introduce this SFX layer, so this SSD acceleration layer, we can add a small number of SSDs to get us the bandwidth quickly, and we can bring in the correct number of nearline SAS or SATA drives to give us the capacity we require. So we can give you, uh, we're in this case, something like a 25% cost advantage and reducing the footprint and the number of disks you have to manage by about 40%. Uh, so this is the block diagram of our storage controller, a high-level block diagram. So when you take out SFA 12K, you open up the box and you see a motherboard and there are two processors on the motherboard. Here is uh, processor one one socket and here's another socket and of course each socket has multiple cores eight cores currently and that'll be changing as time moves on and Intel improves their their core count on their processors and whereas traditionally we've run a block device where the SFA OS RAID engine runs across all these sockets and all these cores we've squeezed that system onto one of these sockets and opened up the other socket to host virtual devices and those virtual devices could be customer applications, and, but more uh, commonly 
and we've been shipping these for many years now, uh, they've been hosting file server systems, such as Lustre or GPFS. So how many Lustre users are in the audience today? We've got one very big one over there. Uh, we've, got a f we've got four or five here. And how about GPFS? Is there any grid scale or GPFS users? Yeah, a similar, similar number. Um, so we've been shipping both these systems in embedded form um, for many years. But as I said before, it's really been uh, taken up uh, much more um, readily now, particularly by the enterprise market, who are coming across these sort of big data problems and they can't now solve them with traditional or even scale out NAS. Because, for instance, the single client performance is nowhere near you can achieve with these native clients you get with a GPFS and, and Lustre. So what we've been able to do is shrink down the what would have been external uh, file servers, external interconnects, and a block device into a single file device, which is the SFA 12K embedded. And as you know, um, is there any people who run the embedded system here today? Uh, we've, got, we've got at least at least one here. Is this an exascalar or a grid scalar? Grid scalar. Grid scalar system. So we can embed these GPFS, what would have been external GPFS servers, inside the device and export the GPFS file system directly from the a, a rack of what looks like a traditional storage array. So this is our current state of SFA. We've just introduced SFX, and we're using that to accelerate intelligently these SSDs. The other area of application divine storage which we have is the object stores. In this case, the application definition is how your objects are going to be protected and distributed around the globe in an efficient manner. And this slide summarizes the architecture of, of the WAS system. So at the base, WAS core, we have the world's most efficient, scalable, uh, simple object store. So this is really a global scale bucket for bits. If you place your uh, objects inside WAS, then in a peer-to-peer -peer distributed fashion, your objects will be distributed, replicated, protected, and they will um, benefit from some nice self-healing advantages, which are a result of the algorithms we use, both in replication and in erasure coding, or object assuring your objects. So if you have small objects or large objects, both can be handled efficiently and fast and replicated around the world using, using WAS. Within the object, there's multiple fields, um, and some of these fields are ones you expect, data, metadata, but also you apply the policy engine in there, and there's also um, a checksum field, and these checksums are checked by a similar code we have in the SFA, this, uh, um, this sort of diff field protection, which will check every read um, it's read, and if it's not correct, then we'll use a different replica or use the erasure coded copies to uh, bring you back the correct data. So, on top of WAS, we are building a number of uh, gateways and methods to access a system. So, fundamentally, the WAS object store is, is very scalable, very simple, very easy to administrate. Uh, the vast development of this product is in the gateways how to get information in and out of this system. So to date, we have the API layer. So very fast, very efficient. We have a RESTful API exposed by all the individual devices. Some of our major customers use our library. So this is an external WAS library which will sit in your, your application servers. So for instance, we have uh, video streaming customers who use WASLib, an extended version of WASLib, to cache large amounts of data at the web layer, so they can stream out video in real time as it's requested from uh, global uh, users. But then those objects can then be put in a globally based ob object store and distributed at the back end via WAS core in a simple and efficient fashion. We also have a multi-tenancy layer, which is WAS Cloud. So WAS Cloud is a, a, a piece of middleware which allows you to do uh, a very, a very uh, heavyweight implementation of a cloud uh, system. So you can have multiple uh, branding, uh, multiple branded user types. So multiple companies might be using your your storage system as some kind of. Uh, um, 
some kind of repository which they access via devices. They can have different branding, they can have different authentication mechanisms for accessing the system, and they can also use uh, methods such as WebDAV and S3 to access the system via Walls Cloud. And on the far side, again this year, since supercomputing, we've been working on these bridge systems. So launched and already tested, I think we'll be hearing a little bit about this in the next talk. Dan? Grid scale at HSM. Um, no. Okay, I'll talk about it now. Good. So announced uh, this time at supercomputing, we had the grid scale or GPFS uh, HSM system. So what this does is it really starts the um, merging of these two different environments. So the SFA block and file systems and these uh, new emerging, uh, very scalable, fast archive systems, uh, of which uh, was is a, a, a premier example. So what the grid scale, grid scale HSM does is, you know, you, you have a, a traditional file system, your users are using this and they see their files and metadata and objects within GridScaler through a traditional POSIX interface. And we need to move this into something that's a very different animal. This, this other animal, this object store is API based, um, it's not POSIX at all, you don't normally expose this directly as a POSIX file system. So we've connected these two um, using the API provided underneath GPFS, the HSM based API. So now you can uh, move files freely between the traditional parallel file system, the scalable fast parallel file system, into the object store using traditional HSM style rules. So if you have a certain directory set or a certain user group or a certain file type that you wish to move into this object store and then replicate and make available remotely in other parts of the globe, then you can use the WAS bridge technology, this grid scaler HSM technology, uh, to do that. Once you've done that, you can access that data in other areas of the world via gateways, NFS or SIFs. And we'll be talking about uh, pretty soon the, the ability to access that by remote grid scaler systems. So in this next release, coming shortly, we'll be able to push data in through one grid scaler system into WAS, have it distributed globally, and observe that data from remote grid scaler systems. And then comes Exascalar. So Exascalar, again, is our, our packaged luster system on top of this SFA. And we will be, this year, uh, doing a similar um, job on the Lustre world. We're kind of waiting for some developments within Lustre. So there's some HSM tweaks being placed into the Lustre code base, which will be available in 2.5. And when that is ready, we will be able to do the same tricks um, under, under Lustre. So we'll be able to take a Lustre file system, use normal HSM rules to move subsets of your file system um, into the object store. There, from there, you can replicate it to remote sites and read it from remote systems. So the third area. So I've talked about SFA, I've talked about the object store. And this year, we launched, between, since now and the last supercomputing event, we uh, launched HScaler. So anybody in this audience, this will be an interesting one, anybody in this audience dabbled with Hadoop? You can put your hands up over there, I'm sure you have. You did, yes. Any other candidates for Hadoop? So it's an emerging area. It's actually one of many emerging areas in, in the traditional sort of big data, i.e. the analytics area. Um, so a reasonable proportion of the market of analytics uh, is Hadoop. There are others, um, uh, so things like Vertica from HP is a, um, a scale-out in-memory database, a KDB KX, a SAS Grid. Um, these are all analytic systems that are in the same field of, of high-end analytics. And we've already applied the SFA to all those systems. For Hadoop, um, this is a special case for us, and it gets a, an appliance called HScaler, which is a fully integrated appliance uh, where we deliver you not only the back-end storage system, but the compute and the network and the software packaged, uh, ready to go. So why would you uh, choose an HScaler system packaged by DDN over a, a maybe a semi-DIY system built off off-the-shelf components? And there are two main reasons. One is manageability and supportability, and the other one is performance. So in terms of manageability, by moving 
all the um, data into a data system rather than into the compute uh, disks spread around all your compute nodes, it becomes a more manageable disk problem. So in this case, we have multiple compute nodes, and every one of those compute nodes does not need a disk. We typically ship these diskless, and they use RDMA over InfiniBand to access the backend data blocks using the same but slightly modified HDFS file system you find in traditional Hadoop. This means that when disks fail, you don't lose nodes. What you do is you have a narrow degraded RAID 6 system, as you would in a normal storage device, and you replace that in, the, in a normal manner. Also, it means that during this MapReduce shuffle phase, which is rather write intensive, you can take advantage of the fact that you're sharing a very high disk bandwidth amongst many nodes. So you're not limiting each node to its internal disk bandwidth, whatever that might be. You're now taking advantage of a very large shared backend disk, disk system. And we're using RDMA everywhere, which means that messages between nodes are extremely fast and accelerated. Reads and writes to storage are accelerated uh, similarly. And this means we can get something like seven times faster than a standard commodity Ethernet connected uh, Hadoop system using this InfiniBand connected SFA system. So the other, the other uh, key benefit which we realized after the PayPal implementation was that uh, as disks fail, what happens is you lose whole compute nodes temporarily. Um, and this means that in practice, you know, disk failures are not uncommon, as we all know. They can lose as many as 20% of their compute capacity through these disk failures. If these disk failures occur in a traditional storage device with RAID and storage management, such as SFA, then we don't lose the compute. The compute continues during disk failures. And of course, we maintain this performance whilst those disks are, re disks are re being rebuilt. DirectMorn is also uh, being uh, refreshed. We'll see in the next few days a new version of DirectMorn. Um, essentially what we've done is we've taken the old DirectMorn, which was a thick client, um, lots of metrics. So um, with DirectMorn you would install the appliance and then you would use this to probe both the SFA uh, system metrics, so there's uh, hundreds if not thousands of metrics in the SFA controller which is collecting in real time about your IO workload, uh, size of writes, um, the uh, bottlenecks occurring within that system. And also you have another layer, right? You have your file systems, uh, GPFS and Lustre, and these also have metrics associated with how overloaded the, the servers are, what kind of network activity they're seeing, and all kinds of metrics there. What DirectMon does is it combines those two metrics into one management system across multiple uh, systems. So you can look at a very large scalable Lustre or GPFS file system with DirectMon with a single view and quickly identify performance bottlenecks as well as um, perform some kind of uh, management and deployment functions within there as well. So DirectMon 2 was, releases just around the corner and this exposes more of these counters, more of these useful counters and also refreshes this interface to make it more usable out of the box. Um, and incidentally we move now from a thick client to just a standard web-based, a kind of slick web-based client. How are we doing for time? About 10 minutes? Something like that. So I mentioned this before, and this is uh, one of the reasons why we have uh, this intelligent, uh, cache-centric architecture today, but it's this whole philosophy of uh, taking advantage of this cache-concentric architectures um, is becoming more and more important as we go forward. So we've all seen, I think, in some of these um, uh, keynote speaks, uh, spe uh, speeches, people talking about the X-scale problem, so um, US national labs of been looking forward and looking at the metrics we're going to have to adhere to uh, and, and cope with over the coming sort of five years up to 2018. One of the major problems I mentioned before in terms of I.O. was that the concurrency, i.e. the number of threads out there in the client, i.e. the compute cluster world, is uh, dramatically increasing. And we need to cope with that, and traditional disks uh, do not cope with that very well. Um, they tend to degrade when we have very high concurrencies on traditional spinning disks due to the physical nature of spinning disks and moving disk, physical disk heads. So breaking down the problem a little bit more, uh, there's three of them. We're looking at an order of a billion threads in terms of scale. In terms of efficiency, the power problem is, is uh, pretty key. Uh, if we just keep adding disks and disks to satisfy the performance requirements, each one of these disks continue to consume just over 10 watts 
each. Uh, that doesn't look like it's changing. The performance of the disk isn't changing. And so the power bill goes up dramatically as we go to 2018. And furthermore, simply to satisfy the performance requirements of an X scale system, so if we take Moore's law and we move towards 2018, we talk about the sort of system we're going to need to uh, satisfy such a compute system, then this becomes unaffordable due to the sheer number of traditional spinning disks we need to satisfy the performance needed for that compute system. So these are some slides um, with some data from um, Livermore. And this is talking about the problem, this problem of, of disks versus SSDs. So if we use pure spinning disks, then the volume of disks means that the cost and the power consumption required for 2018 is prohibitive. If we move to uh, flash-based devices, then we can get the performance within a reasonable budget in terms of quantities of disks, in terms of uh, quantity of money, but unfortunately, in order to meet the capacity required uh, for 2018, the cost becomes prohibitive in terms of pure SSD approach. So somehow, we all know the answer is to make a hybrid system. So we already have a hybrid system on a relatively small scale within the SFA, where we can add a number of SSDs to accelerate the performance and reduce the cost and the power consumption by having a hybrid, hybrid system of SSDs and, and uh, spinning disk. This is even more necessary. This is going to be necessary at much larger sort of scale for the X-scale problem. And this is where a lot of those uh, 100,000, uh, th those dollars we mentioned before, 100 million dollars, um, is being spent uh, over the next five years and we're kind of part way into that program in terms of developing a system which maintains DDN at this sort of forefront of exascale. So we're not going to reveal too much today. We will have NDA uh, systems and we will be, as Dave mentioned early on, um, performing some kind of uh, practical demonstration at supercomputing. So what we can say is that we're going to create this integrated acceleration environment. And this environment is going to comprise not only uh, uh, an optional back-end hardware system, but node local uh, flash as well. And within this node local flash, this burst buffer, we're going to have uh, an extremely advanced replay engine. So those IOs, which are fed into the burst buffer at very high rates from the compute nodes, will undergo uh, a very aggressive reordering such that the data that gets flowed out of the burst buffer into your file system or into your persistent storage system is pristine uh, and therefore gets streamed ideally onto the back-end disk or tape systems. And this is a software system, and it is optionally uh, complemented by hardware, the back end. And as I said, it's a kind of watch this space moment, uh, supercomputing. Uh, in Denver next year, we'll have a capability demo of, of just this product. And so here's our current state. We've got a parallel file system. We believe we're at the lead of all these parallel file system technologies, our prime candidates being GPFS and Lustre. We've now um, uh, added on a analytic system under the name of HScaler using Hadoop from Hortonworks. And this runs on the SFA system, which has now got two systems, uh, two uh, uh, embodiments, the SFA 12K and the SFA 7700 at the mid-range. On the WAS side, uh, we have this uh, very efficient scalable cloud system, and that's been uh, enhanced. We will again see some uh, releases uh, in about one month's time of a new generation of the WASP software, which is going to add some more software features. And again, we'll like to talk to you about that uh, in the private sessions. And we're also uh, rapidly developing these, these gateways, the ways we can move data uh, transparently or under the covers, hidden from users, uh, from uh, the traditional file systems over to object store and vice versa. We're also investing heavily in making sure we stay at this forefront of high performance computing which is our core area. And what this will involve is creating a whole new paradigm for distributed caching. 
working with the next generation memory technologies. So to conclude, so we, th we think we're doing a, a reasonable job across uh, the, both the uh, object store world and the parallel file system world to maintain ourselves sort of appropriate for those top 20% of, of big data problems that are, that are out there. What we know we need to do is really quite radically break away from what we've been doing in the past and what everybody's been doing in the past. We need to come up with a new step change in the whole architecture of how we approach uh, the problems of exascale. We can no longer deal with multiple storage devices at the back end with spinning disks, um, uh, acting as dumb devices for the applications to dump their, their I.O. into. The storage systems need to come uh, more application driven, the storage systems need to become uh, closer, much closer to the compute, and we need to develop new uh, methods for moving data in between compute and the, the back end storage systems, which are going to need some entirely new software layers. I think I'll stop it there. <laughs>